I'm Mary Chapman. Some of you heard my email already about how I'm the inaugural academic director of the Public Humanities Hub. It's a three-year pilot uh, funded by the PRI to offer collaborations among communities, colleagues at UBC and beyond. So today's event, I think that's what you're here for, it's about writing and pitching non-fiction books for its lead audience. Our speakers today will share their years of experience on this topic. Our first speaker is Tom Pierce, a Victoria-based literary agent for Westwood Creative Artists, the premier literary agency in Canada. John represents a wide variety of fiction and non-fiction writers, including Race, and many well-known Canadian writers and journalists, including John Ibbotson, Eve Joseph, Bob McDonald, Bob Doug Saunders, Richard Wagamese, Kamal I. Salai, and Jan Wong. His writers have won the Governor General's Award, the Charles Taylor Prize, the BC Book Prize, the Donner Prize, and many other awards. Prior to becoming an agent, John was executive editor at large at Random House. And but previously editor in chief and associate publisher at Double Canada. Our second speaker is Joel Baca, one of the Public Humanities Hub's fellows for this year. He's professor of law and an internationally renowned legal scholar and commentator. His critically acclaimed book, The Corporation, The Pathological Pursuit of Profit and Power, was published in over 20 languages and became a bestseller in several countries. It also inspired the feature film for the corporation, which won numerous awards, including Best Foreign Documentary at Sundance, and it was a critical and box office success. He's currently completing a sequel book and a sequel documentary film. So this is how it's going to play out. John's going to speak about the different mindset that academics need to adopt to present um, when presenting their work to the trade publisher and about writing for a general audience and about promoting the finished book. And then Joel will talk about the challenges and joys of writing trade books as an academic, why he does it, and what advice he has for um, academics considering this path. And then we'll follow their presentations by Q&A. Okay, John. You're sitting at a dinner party, and the person next to you says, well, I gather you're at the university. Um, what do you do? Now, if you feel like talking and answering that, uh, this is what I think you want to achieve. Within one minute, you want that person to say, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. If they do that, within five or ten minutes, uh, You'd like them to say, well, where can I read more about that? Or are you going to be speaking about this? And a lot of what I want to say is about how you distill what, you're, what you want to do into that one minute or five minute presentation. Um, because let's jump ahead to when, um, when your book is published. Is it better for film if I stand or sit? It's up to you. Um, <laughs> uh, now your book is published, and now, maybe in your dreams, but you're on network TV in the States. You have 90 seconds to pitch this book. Or maybe I'm representing this book, and I have 90 seconds to grab the attention of a Japanese or a German publisher at Frankfurt Book Fair. That's, that's all the time I get. Um, I've got to choose your book rather than somebody else's, but uh, if I do, I've got 90 seconds. Slightly less frenzied than that, maybe you get to write 15 lines about your book that will go into the publisher's catalog and be on the publisher's website. And that, that will go worldwide. Um, let's start by handing this out. This is just the... Um, catalog that my company, Westwood Creative Artists, does for the Frank Frigel one of the book fairs. And you see it's, it's very uh, uh, 
formulaic, if you like, one page per book, but we use that uh, as a guideline. So welcome to the reductive world of trade publishing. <laughs> I handed out those uh, Penguin Canada guidelines. Um, they tell you, well, they, they saved me a lot of work in this presentation because they're really, really sharp, succinct, to the point. Um, and I'm not going to elaborate on them there very much. They're all there. Uh, the one thing I have to caution you about is that they're maybe 15 years old. They're still really applicable, but they say nothing about social media. So it doesn't talk about how, how you, as the writer of a, of a book, uh, need to publicize it through social media. It's obvious, but uh, that, that's the missing thing there. Um, so I guess my question to many of you would be, how much do you really want to write for a wide audience, rather than be uh, recognized and applauded by your peers? Um, Seems to me there are broadly four types of publishing. Obviously, I'm going to talk mostly about trade. But just so that we've got it uh, nailed, there's academic publishing, of course, or all the university presses you know about. There's what I call crossover publishing between academic and trade. And so I'm talking about companies like uh, institutions like Oxford University Press. Har uh, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, who have dis obviously distinguished scholarly publishing programs, but also they engage with the world. Um, so their books are out there in, on Barnes & Noble or Amazon, or, or, or all, all on Amazon, of course, but they may be in Indigo, they may even be in Costco, you never know. <laughs> uh, that, that's crossover publishing. Um, they can do a little bit of both. Um, the third one, of course, which we're not going to talk about today, uh, unless all else fails, is self-publishing. Um, and the fourth one is trade publishing. Um, what I need to stress uh, is that the bigger trade publishers, who, of course, I like to deal with because there's then a chance of not just bigger deals and a better deal for the author, but more resources that they will put behind the bigger publishers these days like to print minimum 10,000 copies. They will occasionally settle for less, and smaller independent houses will settle for less. But, and I'm talking about Canada. I'm talking about the three big publishers in Canada like to print 10,000 copies. And in the States, the numbers are ideally higher. Um, so how can they do that? Well, Simply put, they want a wow factor. If it's nonfiction, they want a big idea or a big narrative. They want something really distinctive. Uh, and what we'll maybe start to look at is how you can take take your area and present it to them that then that way. The process for the adoption of any book in a trade publishing house is so different from peer review, it's night and day. Um, the average editor is a harried person these days, um, jumping in, in many different directions at once, being drawn into sales and marketing far more than they used to be. The purest editor of, of, uh, of yore is gone. Uh, well, they're there, but they're a little suppressed. Um, they're off, these people are often under huge pressure and commercial pressure. They are being sometimes being told by their uh, by the people they report to, you should be looking for reasons to say no to the book. Um, only if you can come to us, rah rah, saying you know this this book I found is terrific. Uh, do, do we want to hear that? Uh, that also raises the bar for writers because with old style editors, it used to be that your book was 70, 70 to 80 percent there. An editor would, would uh, uh, 
come into the picture, help you along, cosset you, and take it up to ideally 100%. They're not likely to do that uh, anymore. Um, so they love it when you present something that is the best possible. I mean, if Dostoevsky can write, rewrite his novel seven times, then you can write your book seven times, if need be, if need be. Um, but what I'm also getting at is that the editor needs to be passionate about your book because they've got to take it through committee after committee. They've got to draw in the chief financial officer, the publicity director, um, the sales force, um, the publisher, all of whom will be looking to criticize this book. Um, and hovering all of this is, is the tyranny of the profit and loss statement that they, everybody has to sign off on to say this thing is viable. It's mostly a work of fiction. I uh, could talk about that. Uh, we once uh, double, they deconstructed all our profit and loss statements in the last 18 years. Most of them were wrong, wildly wrong. But, but people have to believe in them or the book is not going to get adopted. I mean, sometimes it's an underestimate, uh, not just not just the overestimation, I can imagine. So, um, especially when I talk about social media, I want to stress that these editors who might champion your book are looking for for uh, the author's credentials, certainly. That could be just academic credentials, but also the author's platform their network of contacts uh, uh, within academia, but outside as well, including very much with the media. The, um, some books are bought based on how many Twitter followers the Twitter followers the author has these days. It's, it's that so real or, or exciting, it's um, So I wanted to pass around just a few examples of the books by academics that I, I've been involved in for a trade audience. So I'll just give you a pile of four for me. But maybe I'll talk about the first one. Just, we'd like to hold up the one called The First Signs, OK? Um, because I want to talk about the wild factor. Um, Genevieve von Hetzinger, uh, the author, is at UVic, and she is uh, still, I don't think she's finished her PhD yet. She's a world expert on Ice Age rock art. She's been too busy to finish her PhD. It's really interesting. Um, when I talk about a wow factor or headlines, um, I, I was introduced to her by the host of All Points West, uh, who had interviewed her, and I just asked that. The host, who's the best, what's the best interview you've done this year? And the answer was generally. And then I was um, pointed to this. This is a new scientist uh, cover from four, four, five, four, no, five or six years ago. And it, it's about her work with, with the, on the signs and symbols that appear in, um, in um, prehistoric caves. From prehistoric caves dwellers. And it's a bit of a stretch if we're going to be very strict and rigorous. But it's not really wrong. This headline says, Stone Age Code, have we missed the origins of writing? Well, you know, that's, that's a way to make something very specialized and academic, grabby. Um, and that's what we then tried to do with the rest of the book. Uh, maybe I'll just say one more thing about it because it leads to the second part of what I want to say, which is shorter. Um, how do you write such a book? Well, Genevieve has stories galore about exploring caves that nobody else has ever been. She has it, it, she has stories about wriggling, crawling, wandering through, through narrow crevices, wondering if she'll ever get through and if she'll ever get back. That's not going to go into a, into an academic paper, but it sure should go in a trade book. Her grandmother was a, a code breaker at Bletchley. 
well, that's highly re relevant to decoding signs and symbols uh, from the ice age. And we want that in the trade book, where it would have, what her grandmother did would not be relevant to what, she, what she's writing as an academic. So it's a different approach, a different mindset. Um, in all probability, the, the, the book that will fully cover your field is going to be too long for a trade publisher. The one doorstopper there, the Marconi biography, is the exception. And you will notice that that's published by Oxford University Press. It's about, I don't know, 160,000 words long. I was astonished when they said, sure, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> because most trade publishers would say, no, you've got to cut that by 30, 40,000 words. Um, so that's a nice exception. Uh, however, it was bought by uh, a Russian company on the condition that they could bridge it, which is what I've been expecting in the English language. Um, and just one other comment on one of those books going around, one called Let Me Eat Dirt uh, by Brett Finley, who's here at UBC. You'll see there in that book, they've, they've broken up the text with a lot of sidebars, um, boxes, little stories that relate to the main text, but, but they give it a livelier feel. And um, a little factoid that really is directly on target, so it doesn't, wouldn't be in the main text, would not be in your academic paper, but you can easily fit it into the trade book. So, very quickly, I just wanted to talk and say, say three things about the approach to writing a trade book. Um, paramount, if you can do it, is storytelling. Publishers love narrative. They love a story being made out of the material. Um, that could be stories about people, but it could even be stories of an idea. I published a wonderful book by David Bedanis called e, e equals MC squared, the story of an equation, which was a story of 100 years leading up to Einstein and all the people who contributed to that equation. It's a wonderful way to take some fairly heavy duty science and, and make it accessible. Um, so publishers of trade books love drama, they love color, where it exists, I mean, not, you can't force it on the, onto a subject, but they, they love it. Another way you could do that is a detective story about your research. All your research will be there, but in a trade book, you're allowed to tell the stories behind <coughs> that, that research. Second thing, which I'm not going to talk about length, but I'm just going to mention it, is that as distinct, I assume, from a lot of publishing, trade publishers love a voice. They love the feel that they're reading, unfortunately, that there's a personality there, that they're, that they're it could be quite idiosyncratic, it could be, uh, could be, could be quirky, could be um, very personal. And you know, none of this really fits with writing academic work, but this is the sort of thing that uh, trade publishers love. Last point of all, and possibly the most important, simple, plain English. Clear, kind of obvious, or maybe not. I, I was introduced to somebody um, at Moscow State University when I was in Russia, just on, just on vacation. But she gave us a wonderful tour of Moscow State University. Um, and I asked her, and I knew that she talked English, so I was imagining that she, she was an expert on general student or whatever. Oh, no, when I asked her about what she did, she said, no, I teach mathematic, mathematicians and scientists to write um, so that papers can be published in the West. And a lot of our funding, a lot of our money comes from the royalties. And I said, so how do you go about that? She said, well, we, we study what mathematicians and scientists write in North America, and I teach my, uh, the fac my faculty here to write like that. And, and I said, well, isn't that often, I'm sorry about 
that's the apparent prejudice, but isn't that often gobbledygook? Isn't that a lot, a lot of technical jargon, etc.? Oh, yes, she said, yes, yes, absolutely. That's what I teach them. Okay. Uh, and of course, it is true that uh, every discipline will have its own uh, language, its own vocabulary, its own jargon, and that for a trade book needs to be simplified or cut out or explain. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about dumbing something down, but I'm saying if you're going to, if you're going to talk casually about phonemes or neurotransmitters or whatever it might be, for a general audience, that needs quite a bit of explanation. So you should ask yourself, do I need to do that? And when you do need to do that, you have to work, work it in, as if, you, as if you had a class of bright 18-year-olds. 18, 18 um, stylistically, um, I, I don't know much about academic writing these days. I suspect there is still some of the some, some of the old pejorative things, um, such as lots of use of the passive voice. It is thought by some that you know all this judicious <laughs> circumlocution. Uh, anyhow. If, if that still exists in academia, it needs to come out of the training book, okay? And the last thing related to this, once you've got your simple clear language, then, then try and make it as writerly as possible. Chisel every word, word edit yourself. Don't, just don't wait for an editor to stand outside your work. Try, try and... Uh, try and Take, be a self censor add color, add metaphor, all the things that you're not necessarily encouraged to do in academic paper. And once you've done all of that, you'll, you'll be published, no problem at all. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I will, set, I will pass this around just for fun. This is the Japanese ed uh, edition of that book, The First Scientist. Uh, I'm Joel Duck, and I'm obviously the second speaker. <laughs> speaker. Um, John was referring to the reductionist uh, industry of trade books, and I'm a product of that, sufficiently reduced. Um, <laughs> and uh, some days I feel reduced, other days I feel incredibly broadened as a, as a trade book writer. Um, I've had one huge hit, uh, 26 languages, bestseller from Italy to the UK to Canada, um, actually made some money from it. Um, I've had another book that was critically acclaimed and an absolute disaster commercially, um, which made it difficult then to sell the third book, uh, which I did manage to do to a publisher called Knopf in the United States and Penguin in Canada. Uh, and which is due in on January 31st. So I'm in a bit of a state at the moment. <laughs> um, and it's a good time to reflect on doing this, feeling a combination of, of reduced, but also kind of elated, because I have this, this new manuscript that I feel pretty excited about, and my editor feels excited about. And um, I tried to do all the things that John talked about. Um, but I think the most important, or among the important things that John said is the question, why do you want to do this? And the reason, I guess, that I want to do that is I want to sound like something I'm going to read to you now. No matter that people in their hundreds of thousands disfigured the land on which they swarmed, paved the ground with stones so that no green thing could grow, filled the air with the fumes of coal and gas, Locked back all the trees and drove away every animal and every bird. Spring was still spring, even in the town. The sun shone warmly, the grass came to life again and showed its green wherever it was not scraped away, between the paving stones as well as on the lawns and the boulevards. The birches, the wild cherries, the poplars unfolded their sticky and fragrant leaves. The swelling buds were bursting on the lime trees, the jackdaws, sparrows, the pigeons were happy and busy over their nests, and the flies 
warmed by the sunshine, hummed gaily along the walls. Plants, birds, insects, and children rejoice. But men, adult men, never cease to cheat and harass their fellows and themselves. What men considered sacred and important was not the spring morning, not the beauty of God's world given for the enjoyment of all creatures, not the beauty which inclines the heart to peace and love and concord. What men considered sacred and important were their own devices for wielding power over their fellow men. So for me, anybody know where that's from or who wrote it? A hint, it was originally written in Russia in 1899 by somebody named Leo Tolstoy. It <laughs> captures our contemporary moment for sure. And aside from the pronoun problem, which um, you know, was 1899 and got Leo Tolstoy, uh, his last novel, Resurrection, he died in 1910. That's the opening paragraph. And I read that, I don't know, when I was 12 years, 13 years old, something like that. And to me, it was the power of words, the power of language to capture reality, to capture nonfiction, um, but in a way that was writerly, that had characters, that was story driven. I mean, the town is a character, the sun is a character. It's, it's, it's full of imagery, and it's beautiful, and it's moving. It's all of those things. And so the question of why do you want to write for trade nonfiction, um, I think you really have to have your own story as to why you want to do it, or you shouldn't. Because it can be very frustrating and very difficult. You're constantly in a state of compromising. Because as a scholar, you're constantly thinking, what will my colleagues think of this? This seems polemic. This seems rhetorical. This seems too emotional. This seems too funny. This seems like it has too much edge. This seems too story-driven, too metaphoric, too Tolstoyish. And, and so you're constantly in this state of feeling that you're not enough for your colleagues at the university. And some of them tell you that. <laughs> um, but you're also not enough of a storyteller because you're stuck in this framework of holding yourself to all of these academic standards of rigorous research, neutral writing, uh, argument, thesis, hypothesis, proving things, evidence, data, all of that, all of those academic things. And for me, what sort of keeps me going is a fundamental contradiction. And I'll tell you, this is my story. And I think everybody has to have their own story as to why they want to cross this bridge. My story is that I'm an activist scholar. I have a political point of view and agenda. Um, I'm a social critic. I want to change the world. And I talk about justice and democracy and rights and all of those kinds of things and power, all the kinds of things that Leo Tolstoy was concerned about and talked about in this novel and his other novels. And what happened sometime, I guess, in the late 1990s is I couldn't sleep at night because I was caught in this contradiction between, on the one hand, wanting to say things about how the world should be, what we should be as a world, wanting to speak to the people, wanting to, to engage in, wanting to promote dialogue, promote discourse. And on the other hand, I was writing in a way and through publication vehicles and for an audience that were all incredibly elite, that all had a knowledge base that was sort of a, a sliver of the population. I mean, 99.99% of people sort of have expertise in the intricacies of constitutional theory and political philosophy and all of that stuff. And so I was writing in a way that was totally inaccessible to the people and causes that I was talking about. And this is really keeping me up at night. I had a bit of a, a meltdown over it. And I thought I have to do something. And I didn't want to completely abandon everything I had done. I mean, all the degrees and the training and the publications. I, I didn't want to abandon that, uh, but nor did I want to just keep writing 
in this neutral, sort of scholarly, peer review, uh, inaccessible, and elitist way. And so I started to toy with the idea of, of writing a trade book. It's not a perfect solution to the problem, but it seemed to be the best sort of way that I could navigate through not completely abandoning and jumping the academic ship, uh, but also doing something that had a broader reach and that sort of fit with the substance of what I was doing, with the activist nature of the work. And so that's, that's what drove me to it, um, and still does. That and also a love for the kind of language, for words, for cadence, for rhythm, for poetry. I mean, ultimately, that's what you're aiming for. It's, yes, it's, it's definitely storytelling, it's character, um, but it's also the poetry of language itself. That has to be a real draw for you, I think, um, to write to write really powerful and, and great nonfiction. And you know, I, I mean, I aspire. That's why I find that passage so uh, inspiring, and always have, because there's Tolstoy trying to convey in one paragraph a world of his sense of the world, about power, about why we don't see spring, about the fact that it all looks hopeless, but grass is still coming up through the paving stones. That spring will always be spring. Uh, you know, these days, one wonders, quite literally, uh, we may be destroying spring, you know, through climate change or whatnot. So, um, but, but there's this hope, but also this criticism there's this deep diagnosis of where we are at, but but that we should you know lift our heads and look at the warm sun that's shining out. So it's um, words, language can be very powerful, and I I can say that that often gets lost when I'm dealing with my editor in New York, and they're saying you have to start a Twitter account, you know, <laughs> which I have but I haven't looked at in so long, and it gets back to what John was saying that you know all the marketing and all this other stuff, and I'm like I just. I love these words and ideas and the poetry of it and trying to craft the stories and, and everything John says is true. In fact, I have them all written down here. I have five rules for making the transition, but John stated them all. Um, but the rules are characters, not that, right? In other words, people, not populations. You have to start by, by, by looking at a person who becomes a proxy for something else. My first editor on the corporation was a person named Fred Hill. He was a sort of lion of New York publishing and Simon and Schuster. Uh, he, had, he had edited Nabokov and all kinds of other sort of great writers. And he was in his last couple of years. He retired uh, after my book, actually. And, and he said, the, the main thing that academics have to understand is that you, when you're doing academic writing, you just go in with the data, with the with the evidence, with the information, with the analysis. So you can't do that in trade writing. You have to start with the story, with the character, and almost seduce the reader into a curiosity of wanting to know that other stuff. But get them primed, soften them up, so that so that they actually are like, oh great, now I get an explanation for why all this weird stuff is happening with this character. Um, first paragraph of a chapter of mine. And this is far enough away from having read from Tolstoy that hopefully you won't compare my prose to this. Um, it's a cold January night in Davos, high up in the Swiss Alps. Snow falls hard as Bebop Gresta, chairman of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, runs down the town's crowded main street, dancing nimbly among icy patches, trying not to slip and fall. Tuxedo clad and straining to see through fogged up designer glasses, the 40-something entrepreneur is late for a party being hosted by J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon and former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Rumor has it Al Gore will be at the party, he is, and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will show up, he doesn't. The usual coterie of business titans, high-tech entrepreneurs, and government and NGO officials will surely be there networking boozily through the night, aglow with their own good fortune, champagne flowing and music booming. Welcome to Davos, the usually sleepy Alpine village that transforms into party central for the global elite each January when the World Economic Forum comes to town. 
So now, hopefully, you're kind of interested in this guy. What's he doing running down the street? This party with all these glitzy people at it. What's going to happen? And in another four pages or so, I introduce another character. They come together. Um, we were shooting a documentary as well, so we were actually there. These two characters come together. They meet Jamie Dimon. We have a whole story. And then I can start to get into unpeeling my analysis, my thesis, my argument that I want to make about how this is all intense bullshit. And I mean, I don't say it in those terms, I, but, but now the reader is ready, having invested in this story and, and running through the streets and at this party and Jamie Diamond's there and Tommy Blair and everybody's joking and blah, blah, blah. And, and now they're ready for something. So story and character are important. Um, you also want to, this is really just repeating what was said. So rule number one, character, not data. Rule number two, story, not analysis. Uh, to lead. Rule, rule number three, move people, don't just inform them, uh, don't uh, just try to convince and inform them, move them, try to appeal to their emotions, their hearts, have passion, have pathos in there. Not in all kinds of drippy language and prose, but in the structure, in the story, in the little, the little things that you say, get people to care about what's going on. Sort of prime them for your side and then, then hit them with the argument. Um, be writerly. Rather than treating writing as a means, treat it as an end. You know, in academia, we treat it as a means. It's like, oh, we have to do it, you know, to convey our ideas, right? We, we have to write. We have to be clear. We have to express what we're doing. We have to use the jargon. And we have to write at this high level uh, that takes, that presumes that everybody has the same knowledge base we do. So it's all, it's instrumental. Treat, treat writing as an end in itself. It's beautiful. We lose sight of it these days with all the visual and data and digital this and that and the other thing. We lose sight of how beautiful writing is, how its rhythm, cadence, words can move. Um, and so to do that. Explanation, not exposition. This gets back to, I think, you're the intelligent 18-year-old. Your audience, when you're a scholar, are other people with your knowledge base that slim sliver, the 10 people who are experts in your field. And, and if you try to appeal to a wider audience, it's like, oh, you know, that person's not very smart. Obviously, they don't know what they're talking about. It's almost like the more obtuse you can be, uh, the more rewarded you are often in, in the academic world. Because your writing then shows that you don't have to explain because you already know, and your audience already knows, and everybody already knows. So it's like all inside baseball. Scholarship is one big inside baseball thing. It's, it's, and, and, and that's kind of the idea of it. Whereas here, you have empathy for an audience that doesn't understand what you understand. So one way to think about it as academics is think of your writing less in terms of how you write as a scholar and more in terms of how you teach as a scholar. That, that, you know, how would you craft a lecture? How would you craft a talk that you're going to give to people who don't necessarily share your knowledge base? We all do that as teachers. And somehow when we're, when we're writing, we think we're doing something different. Well, when you're writing nonfiction trade, put yourself more in your teacher's space than in your uh, scholarly writer space. Um, so really, I mean, the, the other, the final note is that, as I mentioned that, you know, we don't want to leave behind, I certainly didn't, all of the training, all of the stuff that's great about academia, thesis, argument, theory, theory theoretical frameworks, communication, analysis, information, rigor, accuracy, fairness, research, scholarly research. What I, what I see we can do as academic trade writers is this amazing combination of our sense as scholars, a kind of journalistic sensibility, and the great novelist sensibility. We can merge those three things. The kind of investigative, factual, revelation, invest, uh, uh, sort of revealing things that journalists do with the theory the analysis, the rigor, the research that we as scholars do really well, 
with the writing of a great novelist. To me, that's the ideal nonfiction trade book. Because we, what we really shouldn't do, I mean, we, we often talk about our deficiencies as academics trying to do trade writing. But we also have to think of our strengths. What makes us unique is that we have that theory. We have that rigor. We have that understanding. We have those literatures. We have those scholarly research skills. What, what our unique contribution is, as opposed to a journalist or as opposed to a novelist who's writing nonfiction or fiction, what our unique thing is, is all of that. So it, the thing isn't to abandon it, but to translate our ideas into this other way of communicating. And if we can do that, if we can write a book, I mean, one of the things that I feel best about is that I wrote books for popular audiences, but they're used in university courses. And to me, that's the ideal. Like, that's what makes me really happy, that they have the scholarly rigor in them, that they can be used in a university course and by researchers, but they also can be read on a beach or on the bus by a member of the elusive intelligent lay public. Um, and, and that's kind of what we're aiming for. So we're not trying to abandon our scholarly self. We're trying to translate the incredibly deep insights that we have through our scholarly self into something that others can, uh, can access. Um, OK, I'll stop there. Thanks. Front and then we'll have a Q&A. Sure. Okay. Any cues? Yeah. Just a, just a very kind of practical strategic one. If, uh, if we wanted to pursue an academic trade book, at what stage in the process would it make sense to be talking to um, agents or editors or um, does one, does one write a book and then start shopping around, or something like that? So, a novel ha pretty much has to be written before it can be shown in the book. The non-fiction book can be sold based on most of the things in that handout. An outline, an, an overview, actor outlines, and maybe one sample. That is a frequent way to sell books. I'm just doing it right now, uh, this week. Um, book isn't written yet, but one chapter has been written, which is at a high level, which is really does represent the, the, the texture, uh, the flavor of the book. So people know that it's not just uh, high in the sky. It's not just a great idea, uh, uh, a great structure for a book. Um, but the delivery is there in writing writerly terms. Uh, at that point, I or, or my colleagues could try can try to sell it. We have to be convinced first, but uh, you don't have to write the whole book. I, I know one or two academics, especially if they have tenure, who write the book first because they don't need the money. But I have journalists I represent. Who, who have a relatively high salary, and they have to replace it for a year or 18 months while they write a book. And so I have to get them that sort of deal ahead of them committing to the book. Uh, but it can, it can be done at that early stage. And then a fair number of books are abandoned at that early stage because they don't get the publishing contract that they want. Yeah, I, I would say that. Uh... I've never written a full book. Um, the publishing deals I've gotten have been based on a chapter, plus uh, you know the stuff, the, an outline, sort of roughly 500 word descriptions of each chapter, uh, assessed what the market is going to be, uh, why are you writing the book? There are various sort of standard things like that, um, and then a sample chapter. Um, yeah, that's. And then you get the advance, and that allows you to either take some time off or hire research. Uh, that's, yeah, depending on how big the advance is. Uh, in Canadian publishing, you're usually, typically these days, uh, 
not going to get an advance that will pay for a full year of living. Um, but if you get a sort of US Canadian combo deal, maybe. Thank you so much for the very engaging slam and also for thanking us for one question about a particular type of genre, a particular type of book, and where it fits within your four categories of whether it's a trade book or perhaps a crossover for the academic publishing. Most of the sort of, um, I think of it as public intellectual books, sort of the Brad Spannons, the David Saeeds, the yeah. Thomas Piketty's. Um, where do they fit in? Is there a market for that? I take those books not so much to be about narrative and storytelling, but more sort of higher level social reasoning. Well, all those books are published by trade publishers, I think. Um, and it's amazing where great ideas and um, a track record can take you. Um, those pu the publishers of those books uh, clearly feel feel they can uh, get a sufficient audience, and they can. Um, and it may be that their their previous books sort of support this. There's now a following for for that writer. Um, I I didn't mean to say that uh, a non-narrative, non-storytelling book couldn't. I did talk about big ideas, and that's that's sufficient. And you start looking at, I, I mean, this guy is a storyteller too, but if you look at New Bible North, you know, career is success. Three books now. Uh, they're packed, those books are packed with ideas. I mean, they're, they're presented in a lively way, true. But uh, there, are a there are a handful of editors around the world, New York and London particularly, um, who are looking for exactly that sort of book. Um, if, you're, if you are unknown, if you don't bring any previous credentials to it, that's going to be tough, but you can break through it. Yeah. I don't think it, it, I, those, those books are not published by crossover or academic publishers, and they don't need to be still. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, my, my own work is a real, um, crossover of storytelling and then more, I guess, academic in a way, but written in a less academic way. Stuff. I don't, I don't lead everything with stories. I really mix it up, and and that can work as long as the rhythm of the mixing is good. As long as a story shows up at the point where the reader is starting to feel like it's too academic, and vice versa. I would say thank you, it's been really great. Um, I'm asking this question in the capacity of my current position as senior advisor of the provost on racial as faculty. And I wanted to ask you something about the kind of turn that I'm seeing, where we're seeing a lot more memoirs by racialized faculty members sharing their story about their experience in the academy. So I'm thinking about in the States, people like Tracy Cotton and Casey Lehman. But here also, people like uh, Tessa McWatt, who's a new book coming out, and uh, Jenny Wills, and uh, Kamal also lately, who has hinted at some of these things. Is there an appetite for these kinds of stories within the Canadian context? And how can we encourage those stories from racialized faculty members to share their story if there is an appetite for that? Yeah, you go, you go first. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I think that um, there, there obviously is an appetite just by virtue of the fact that those authors are selling books and getting and getting new audiences, but I'm I'm probably no more expert in the kind of market out there uh, than any of you. It's always a surprise to me what works and what doesn't. So that's why that's why I'm deferring okay. to John. Well, what I would say, and I, I don't want this to be seen as cynical. What I would say is there is a huge appetite for that at the moment because the gatekeepers, i.e. the editors in publishing or the TV producers or whoever else, uh, have 
adopted this as, as almost their primary goal. But um, you may have noticed in Vancouver <coughs> International Writers Festival that the composition of the of writers and speakers has changed quite quite extensively in the last two or three um, years. Partly because of a new artistic director, a new vision, but I will, uh, this is why I said I don't want you to treat this cynically. Um, funding. The Canada Council is funding diversity over almost everything else. Uh, uh, and the gender issues too, but just, just talking about diversity. And um, the Vancouver Festival will get more of a grant if they, if they publish, uh, pub publish from, from uh, writers of color or women, etc. And I'm noticing this. I'm stuck. Uh, this is not my, uh, my only metier, but I am stuck with a few older white males who are finding it very difficult to get published and get, in fest get on festival stages these days. Uh, and and that's, a, you know, that's an understandable and a fair redressing of a terrible balance that they used to be. Um, but there is a, um, there is an appetite amongst the, uh, you know, if you sat in a publishing house and there were 10, 12 people around the table, you know, the, if, if I, if they, if somebody brings forward Kamal al Salehi's book uh, versus something by a 60 year old prof from Regina or some white male, you know, I know which one's going to get adopted. Uh, and it's, it's often on merit and it's, and are addressing the balance, which is great. Sometimes it's it, it's not actually on merit, not particularly so. Um, so it, I, I I applaud this. I think this is terrific. Um, but um, I I don't see any uh, any sort of restraint uh, being put by the gate, gatekeepers on who can write, whose voice counts, etc. On the contrary. I think that there's an explosion of interest in, in different unexpected or suppressed, previously suppressed voices. Hey, uh, thank you both so much. I, uh, I'm just finishing up writing a crossover book for the first time, and I'm doing the edit right now. And from the very beginning until this morning, <laughs> I've been struggling with um, something that you, you were talking about, Joel, that resonated with me, is balancing the political with the neutrality that I'm used to as a historian, that I've been trained to exhibit in my work and that my colleagues judge me by. Um, and so I, I was just wondering if you have any advice, any strategies. For me, I kept going back to, well, I need to show my sources. But that kind of conflicts with the kind of more storytelling elements, or at least it, I was finding that, that it kind of conflicted with giving a better narrative. Um, so you kind of just get any, any yeah. methods or strategies? Yeah, no, it's something, it's something that really, well, there, there are sort of two parts to your question that are connected. One is, um, is, it, is it okay to have a strong political thesis and to write from that place? And that kind of connects to the question that we were just looking at, um, because a lot, of, a lot of that work is premised on, on a strong political thesis. Um, as is my work. Um, and the second is, the second point of your question is how do you construct a narrative that isn't cluttered with sources to defend because you feel on the defensive, because you have a political POV? Um, how do you do that? And, and my answer is endnotes. So I'll, I'll address the, the second question first as a technical question. Um, I don't want to allow a kind of academic sourcing feel to the book to distort the feel of, of narrative and story. Whether that narrative is a story within the larger story or that narrative is the larger story. I don't want to keep saying this, you know, see this site and see that site and all of that. I do use a lot of, I do a lot of interviews and so uh, some of the sources are talking in the book. You know, somebody like Rob Reich or, um, I don't know, uh, who 
Elizabeth May, a Canadian, or, or just uh, Chief Stuart Phillip. Those are a few people who are in the book. And, and so their voices are in the book. And so they're kind of sources, but they get woven into the narrative. Um, when it comes to academic stuff, my books tend to be sort of two thirds text and one third notes because I have very extensive, uh, in my previous two books, trade books, I have very extensive footnotes. Uh, now, the, my editor at Knopf believes that even the footnotes, just the little numbers, interrupt the narrative. So we've gone to a different style where you have sort of the, the first few words of the sentence and the page number, so that's that's your tag. So, so you know, you read that uh, some factual statement, and then you see the three or four words that summarize that, and then you have a bunch of sources. And so, I have lots of academic sources in those endnotes to support propositions that might seem uh, untrue. They're not, but they may seem so because they're. They're so extreme, where they show corporations doing such terrible things, or or whatever. So I want to be sure that I'm backing that up. But in terms of the first question, I think I think there is perfectly legitimate to have a point of view, to have a thesis, to have uh, a perspective, to say you know diversity is important, and universities aren't always uh, nurturing and and, and uh, receptive to it or corporations are problematic because of this. Um, and you're making an argument. It's like you're making a case. You know, I'm a lawyer, right? I, I make cases. And I've always felt in my work, I'm making a case. I'm trying to persuade the reader. I'm using story. I'm using good writing. Um, but I am also using sources. But I, I put them in, in the footnotes. So, so that, that's what I do. Don't compromise your, don't compromise your narrative. If, if you're feeling you're compromising it, throw it in a note. But your publisher is still putting those notes in the book. Yes. Right? yes. I've never quite understood why those notes can't just be put on the web or hypertext, you know. I don't. Oh, it, it, uh, I would, that would make me that so mad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't know. Those notes are my security blanket. Well, they're they my, they're, 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 they're my, they're no, no, they're my <laughs> life raft to still being a scholar. I in this. Albeit I'm not taking them away. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, I find them somewhere else. Not somewhere else. I want okay. them. To, <laughs> whether it's a digital copy or a print copy, that's how. That's the only way I can make the deal with myself. Is to know that there's a Harvard Law Review article that's supporting this point readily at hand. You don't have to go click on somewhere. <laughs> don't, so there's not. Don't tell. Don't tell my editor that. Right. <laughs> Sure are. I just want to, I'm curious about, um, go back to credentials for one second. Um, so when, for a first time author, um, pitching a book first to a literary agency, and then is there another pitch to a publisher if that agency takes on that person, or do you, sort of sort of the process for someone who's never done this before, I'm, I'm curious about. So, like, credentials, PhD with a moderate Twitter following. <laughs> You know, that's so. I'm just a guy, right? Um, well, you, you can't invent credentials for sure. Uh, and a great idea will, will will vault you over that issue. I, I'm just I'm just saying that if you have an American editor looking at two equivalent books, you. you books that overlap in subject matter, for example, and one is coming from a well-known Harvard professor, and the other's coming from you know, an utterly unknown person with no social media following. They're gonna go with the Harvard professor because they can, uh, they can trade on that. Um, if the unknown writer has written something brilliant that is way better than what this Harvard professor turned in, you can turn that around. And um, if you have uh, an agent who sees that, they can be, your, they are your advocate. They're, they're your cheer cheerleader. They can make the case uh, for, for this unknown writer's book. 
That's what we do all the time. We put a lot of effort and, and passion into it if we have been sold already, if we believe this. Um, so I, I didn't want to suggest that there is a, um, uh, there's an, uh, an impediment in not, well, there's an impediment, but there's, there's no prohibition on people who, who, who don't have a platform. But I do know that platform is the one word that I keep hearing when people are, especially Canadians, are being rejected. Uh, in the states, well, you know why? If if, if your author was uh, had a guest spot on CNN regularly, you know, if your author was doing op heads in the New York Times, you know, we, we would take this book because it's interesting. But they're not, so we're not going to. So it's tough, but it's not insuperable. There's there's a lot of serendipity as well. I mean, maybe less so now, but you know, I had a friend who had a friend who knew the head of Penguin Canada, Cynthia Good, at the, back in the uh, early 2000s. And I had an idea, and I drafted a proposal, and the friend gave it to the friend who gave it to Cynthia Good. And Cynthia Good loved it, and I was on a plane to Toronto. And then Cynthia Good put me in touch with an agent in the United States, and then that agent sold it after having it rejected by just about every publisher then one publisher picked it up. So, you know, that was serendipity. I, I happened to know somebody, um, and that's, that's always helpful. So I have no idea what would have happened if I had just cold called the idea to an agent, like John or, I, I mean, any, anybody else, especially somebody in the U.S. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know how much I was served by that serendipitous uh, connection or, or how much it, the idea itself was strong. What I do know is that uh, the three books that I've done now, and one of them, as I said, the deadline, it's coming out in September and the final deadline's the end of this month, um, have never been easy sells. It's never... Um, oh, you know, you're Joel back in the area public manifesto. It's never like that. I, my laurels, maybe some people can rest on their laurels. My laurels, I don't know where they are, but because every time it's like it's like you have to you have to sell the thing so hard again, and there are so many rejections, um, and and so it's not easy. It's um, and I'm not a person with uh, a bit, you know, I'm not on CNN yet, I've done a few op-eds from the New York Times, things like that, but I certainly in the United States, I'm not a, a known entity at all. Um, but, you know, the, the first book, The Corporation, is fairly well known, but that, it just doesn't guarantee anything. I mean, there's just, it's hard. Um, I, would, I would say, if you have a really great idea and can formulate it in a really great way, and it's new and it's fresh and, and you can write, you know, and you have a strong sample chapter. Um, you know, and you approach somebody like John or somebody at Westwood, um, you'll get a fair shake. I, I want to go back to what I was saying about contacts and network, networks. I take on most of the writers I take on because of referrals. Somebody might be a writer I, I'm representing already. It could be a uh, head, head of creative writing here or anywhere else. It could, uh, it, 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 it could be a head of department, etc. Somebody comes to me and says, I, I, have, I have a student who wrote something terrific. You should look at it, right? Um, and I pay a huge amount of attention to that because I can't scour the earth for, all, for, for talent. I, Honestly, don't have the time. So I hope that focal figures in academia or in media or, or among, in, amongst writers, focal figures will um, sort of screen things for me and, and alert me to something special. So you need to put yourself in that position. Somebody who might be your supervisor, might be your head of Department might be a famous writer who looks at what you've done and says, "This is this is great. You should get this to John or some some somebody like me." 
and uh, be shameless about it. Okay? Thank you both. <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you very much, it's very helpful. I have a couple of quite specific questions. So um, one is, so I've already done an academic trade book with Harvard, which is actually where PGT was published, incidentally, so it's an example of an unexpected crossover. Um, but they require you to, to provide your next expose to them initially. So I'm wondering how you as an agent might deal with that kind of situation. Um, and whether you ever encounter that. And the other that I'm wondering is, like, maybe following up on Manel's question a bit, whether you ever see disparity in what is offered to different types of authors depending on who they are. Um, is it related to their gender, their identity in some way, or is it more their idea, or do you see any kind of trends in that or not really? Okay, taking the second one uh, first. Overall, publishers are making a, a almost mathematical, clinical uh, assessment of how many copies they can sell. <coughs> As I said earlier, they frequently get that wrong, but they, they try to form a consensus about that. Um, and that's what drives what they pay for a book. Now, if there is a flavor of the month, whatever it might be, uh, uh, it might be something to do with who is writing it, or maybe the topic, etc. They will say, all right, this is the flavor of the month, therefore it will sell more. It, so it, it, it's not that this, is, this writer comes from a certain uh, space, it's that that space is popular, fashionable, and therefore more people want, uh, are, are reading that, that sort of book. It could be a memoir, it could be anything. Um, so it, it, it's it's not a direct it's not direct, but it, it it's following the zeitgeist. I mean, the pub publishers try to be ahead of the zeitgeist, and they frequently get it wrong. But but uh, and by the, they also sign up books because of the zeitgeist, and then when it's published two years later, the zeitgeist the zeitgeist has gone somewhere else. But what are they going to do? Um, the first question, I, I'm not sure I fully got it. You said if you write a, a second, they needed a second expert. So you no, what's so the first writer refusal? Oh, first writer refusal. You don't mean what the second book is it going to be. Yeah, um, most trade publishers are going to try to insist on that. And it's pretty hard to, um, it's pretty hard to resist that. The important thing about an option course, because that, that's what you're talking about, the, the next book has to go to them. The important thing is that it's, I don't want to say it's not worth the paper it's printed on, but yes, you have to go back to them with your new idea, but if you don't like what they say, you can walk away. You're not tied to them in any way. You should not uh, give what's called the matching option, which if they, they pay enough money and you want to go somewhere else, the first publisher can still buy the book for the same don't want to get into stuff like that. You want to keep it clean. Yes, you will show them the new idea, but if you don't like what they're saying, and you don't like the money that's attached to it, you can go somewhere else. So that would be an easy, and, and sometimes it just works itself out. Your editor at Harvard may recognize that the next book isn't really a Harvard book. You know, sometimes it won't be an issue. They'll say, you know, you should, you should take back to Simon Schuster. We're not the right people anymore. Sometimes it's tough, though, and it's it's a fight, and they would like to keep you as an author, but you don't want to stay. Maybe you weren't, maybe you weren't treated very well, uh, and you, you don't feel they they put the boat out for your book. Fine, don't take their offer. It's not not really difficult. Now, if you have an agent who is uh, mediating this for you, if you have a broker, if you have a champion. You don't even have to do that confrontation yourself. The agent will do it for you. Yeah. We, we don't love confrontation, but we do it very well. <laughs> we have to. No, I mean, that, that's my experience with first try to refusal is, is really, you can always say, sorry, but I'm not going to accept that offer. And they'll say, well, we'll give you $10,000 more, and I'm not going to accept that offer. They can't force you to take the offer. They can force you to submit it to them first. Yeah. And the other side of first writer refusal is, of course, they, they may not take it. 
Uh, so I was with Simon and Schuster, and they of course tried to refuse a long guess what that I'm currently doing, but they said no to it. So I had to go elsewhere. You know, they uh, they refused. They exercised their right to refuse. <laughs> <laughs> now because I know people are going to teach. I just want to remind you we're pulling together our website and when our website is up it will have videotapes of other workshops that have already happened in the series or presentations about media training. So uh, if you want to improve your, uh, your profile you can look at the one about writing op-eds, starting with the conversation which is really nice. Uh, media outlet that understands working with professors and really helps them write their first op-ed or commentary, and usually those um, articles go viral and they collect analytics which you can share with your publisher and prospective publisher and say, so you want to do this piece. So um, look back to our website in, in a month or two and we'll have resources for you. We're also preparing to address a very local sources and ideas that sort of complement what the speaker's general um, advice has been. And if there are things you need help with, let us know. You know, if there's a, a genre you want help with or some connection you need, please, please let us know. Okay, please join me in thanking our two speakers today.